Hi, my name is Haley Mills. I'm the podcast producer for Integration Nation. In this episode, Allison and I talk about one of the various stages of life, more specifically, the floundering stage that a lot of young adults tend to experience. We both discuss how floundering plays a key role in a person's intersectional identity in this conversation. Hi, I'm Allison Sullivan, a licensed clinical social worker, psychotherapist, and you are listening to Integration Nation, a podcast to introduce you to and expand your knowledge about effective, integrative mental health concepts, practices, and approaches. In our episode today, I'm going to have a conversation with our very own Haley Mills, who is the marketing assistant at the practice, the IT expert, the general can do whatever comes in our business that day, as well as one of the producers of the podcast. She's such an asset to our practice and to this community. She holds a BS degree in business with a specialization in marketing. She's an avid powerlifter, a title holder in powerlifting, a lover of all things bright and beautiful and meaningful. And we're going to have a conversation today about this aspect of identity that we have termed the floundering. Basically, whenever we feel lost or unsure, we're in some way in that floundering space. So enjoy. I'd like to take a minute to recognize one of our podcast sponsors, Dragonfly Yoga Studio of Fredericksburg. You can find them at dragonflyyogafred.com or by visiting 810 Caroline Street, right in the heart of beautiful downtown Fredericksburg. What I think makes Dragonfly unique is the depth and variety of the classes that you can experience at the yoga studio and the unique set of skills that each teacher involved in Dragonfly brings individually and so what the staff brings collectively. If you go to their website, right on their homepage in a super easy to navigate way, you'll see several pictures that highlight the different classes and types of classes that are available from new to yoga and beginner to multi-level vinyasa flow to hot yoga, restorative and yin yoga to specialty classes. Most weekends, they have workshops that help people who are new to yoga and even advanced practitioners deepen their practice, understand their practice, increase their wellness, connect to themselves, all such important ways to, you know, just meet yourself where you are and join in a compassionate way with yourself in your healing journey. So definitely check them out. In fact, they have a new student discount right now where you can get unlimited yoga classes and that's in excess of 50 options per week for $45 a month. So check them out at dragonflyyogafred.com. All right. So Haley, I am really pumped to have this particular conversation with you because it's supremely relevant in your life. We were talking a little bit before we got started about how it's relevant in people's lives, you know, at various times. But I think in young adulthood, this is the most pronounced that people experience what what we're calling the floundering, that kind of stage in your life where you just have no idea what to do, you feel ill-equipped to figure it out, and there's all kinds of pressure to hurry up and figure it out, and not only hurry up and figure it out, but figure it out in the right way. And as I've been doing this work and living my own life alongside, I've come up with what I think are six stages that I thought we could talk about in the floundering. Stage one being overwhelm. Stage two being the intense anger phase of 
why me? I mean, we could also talk about it from, you know, just over personalizing, like, why is this happening to me? I'm the only one this is happening to. And then stage three would be doubt. I can't make the right choice. I'm not sure I can make the right choice. What if I don't make the right choice? What is this going to mean for the rest of my life? All that kind of thinking. And then there's kind of a respite phase that comes after that, where you start to gain a little bit of confidence of, okay, well, maybe I can make a few choices. And the few choices that I've made seem to be working out okay. The bottom hasn't really dropped out which then leads to the fifth stage of disillusionment when you realize, okay, this is actually a lot of work and it's totally not perfect. And what if this is the best it gets? And then that leads into the last stage of the floundering. That's really about self-acceptance. There's no right way, only ways that are right for me. So what do you think? Yeah, I 100% agree With those stages, obviously, it's not concrete for every single person, and you might not be able to identify each stage when you're in it. But looking back, for me personally, I can definitely identify each of those stages with a time period of life. In the start of my young adulthood, beginning graduation from college and going into that stage of overwhelm of, oh my gosh, I'm an actual adult. What do I do? I have to take care of myself. I don't even know how to take care of myself into this like stage of, I don't know if I would call it anger for me, but that intense, just like questioning of myself, that intense doubt of why am I not getting a job and everybody else is getting a job. Yeah, that's where comparison shows up. You're so right. Yeah. And especially me personally being a type four on the Enneagram always comparing myself. (laughs) I was like, why is everybody else so successful? They're traveling to India or all of these places. And I'm at home with my grandparents' chickens. Like, (laughs) what is going on? There's no internet. I can't even do anything. And then going through all the rest of those stages to where I'm at, to self-acceptance and learning, there is no right way, but just making those choices both and like an episode where you talk about that. It's not that if I make this choice and it's the wrong decision, my whole life is ruined. It's okay. I'm making this choice and whatever happens is going to influence me to continue to be the person that I am destined to be, that I am going to be. Just at this point, all decisions I've made, I don't regret because they have made me into who I am now. And all of the events leading up to that has created me into the person that I am today that I love and I love how I've gotten here, even though some of the things have been painful, they haven't been the best or some of the things have been great, vice versa. Um, That's where I'm at. And I've just learned there's no perfect decision, no perfect choice, only the choice that I make. And you just have to lean into it and go with it. That's so right on. And I think we met, I think you came to work at the practice somewhere around like step three or four, somewhere between, you know, just riddled with self doubt of I can't make the right choice to, you know, some kind of respite of okay, well, I'm starting to make some choices, I'm at least making choices. And I know that when you came here, you know, working because initially, when you came here, it was only for 10 hours a week. Yeah. And I, <laughs> I know <laughs> that that was not at all your ideal but there were aspects about the job that were appealing to you because of what you'd be doing day in and day out. And there were aspects about being involved in a small business that you also liked. Um, So those things were enough for you to just say, okay, I'm just going to make a step towards by making this decision. Yeah, for sure. Especially being where I was at, it was really such a great opportunity and such a door that was open to me as well because so many doors were shut and that's part of the intense anger stages all yes. of these doors just being slammed in my face and making me feel incompetent because I know I thought that I could do these things I thought well this is what I graduated for but nobody's hiring me for this so maybe I can't right. me nobody's giving me, nobody's giving me a chance and yeah. that's another really important point it's so vulnerable when you have no experience being an adult So you don't have tons of like successful outcomes to lean into in adulthood. 
And yet you're asked to be so vulnerable to put yourself out there for all of these job applications and interviews. And people do typically hear, no, no, not right now, not the chosen applicant. And after so many no's, you're so right. It does increase the doubt of like, "Uh uh-oh, maybe I'm not who I think I am. Oh, for sure. Or just not even hearing back. I don't even think I heard back from 90% of the jobs that I applied to. That's <laughs> awful because all that you have to like mobilize within yourself to have the courage <laughs> to take the risk and then it's dead air. Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. So that definitely causes people to be think, what's wrong with me? Like, why am I not hearing back from these places? And then you're just in that stage for a little while, especially for those who do go to college and graduate, or even those who go right into the workforce, it's hard figuring out, well, what job is for me? All of these people are moving up to management, or all of these people are going to college, and I'm stuck in this job. Or you go to college and you graduate, and you're like, all these people are getting offered $70,000 paying jobs straight after graduation. I couldn't even find a job that right. did that. Right. And, and that kind of comparison... When you can see, okay, well, it's happening for some people, it's not happening for me, can really feed that self-doubt and really kind of encourage people to over-personalize it instead instead of taking a broader lens of, okay, well, wait a minute, not all industries are the same. Not everybody's life takes a perfectly parallel trajectory. And just because my experiences are diverse from my peers doesn't mean anything's wrong. Exactly. Or even going into the doubt phase too, I can't make the right choice of thinking, well, all of these people are getting these awesome jobs, paying a ton of money. They're also giving up their freedom working 40 to 60 hours a week, if not more. Whereas that's not what I wanted to do. I did not want to go into the corporate world. I wanted to work with small businesses. And I would often forget that because everybody else is going straight into corporate all of the business majors that I graduated with or had interned with were going into that. And that might've been their dream, but that was not my dream. And so that was yep. causing me to think, well, maybe I can't make the right choice because by their definition of successful, I'm not meeting that standard. Exactly. Or even maybe I have the wrong standard. It can really feed self down that way. And I think that's a really vital point because anybody who picks a path or feels pulled on a path that is not where the majority of people are going It takes extra courage and extra self-confidence to stay on that path because it can feel lonely. If you're not like right in the center of the pack, moving with the pack, it can feel extra vulnerable out there, especially when it looks like on the outside that people are getting benefits, a lot of benefits pretty quickly from being right in the center of the pack. Oh, for sure. For sure. So what do you think in your own experience helped you move from the doubt and the disillusionment of floundering more into self-acceptance? A lot of different things. I know we have a few, a lot of episodes coming out, many episodes about self-care and different forms of that. I think a lot of that had to play into part is number one, connecting with myself in a form of self-care and my thinking and realizing, okay, you're comparing yourself to other people's standards and also physical self-care, having an outlet to go do things. With. Yes, physical self-care is so important to manage the stress because this is arguably one of the most stressful life transitions a person goes through. And so the physical outlets that you find that you are really connected to do, I see it. I see it with you. It helps you manage your stress. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing is I, I've been doing powerlifting for a few years. And that's something that if you know me, you know I'm a powerlifter. And I'll tell you that all the time, but that's one of the things I quit that for a little while and did a triathlon. And that was one of the first things when I did the triathlon with minimal training. And if you know me, I'm not, I'm not a swimmer. I can run and bike, but I'm not very fast at them, but I'm definitely not a swimmer. So people would laugh at me when I told them I was going to do a triathlon because that was just absurd. And so when I actually did it and I actually crossed the finish line, it was that little sense of, yes. okay, if I can do this, if yep. I can complete this, then I can do other things. And I don't even have to be perfect at it. Oh, I yeah. can still want to do it. 
and get a lot from the challenge of doing it and seeing it through from start to finish. Exactly, because that was my goal. Is I wasn't trying to get first place. I know when I, when I was coming out of the water, grand, the waves before us had started, before my wave, there were people coming back in from the bike part already. <laughs> and they were just giving me the meanest look. But I was so determined because I was like, you know what? You didn't have to backstroke the whole time because you were scared of doing freestyle for the swim part, you know? But once I crossed that finish line, even though I was one of the last people to cross it, I still crossed it. I still did it. In a way that you needed to, which is another really important point, because, you know, what I heard you just share is you had to meet yourself where you were because of some of the, your relationship to swimming, you had to adapt in a way that maybe did impact how efficiently you did it, but you still found a way that worked for you to do it. Yeah, and I wasn't getting dragged out of the water from drowning, so you know it works for so me. That's a win. That's definitely a win. I definitely took a break. They had kayakers out, and I would take breaks. I made friends with one of the kayakers. That's how bad I was at swimming. But even <laughs> powerlifting, it transfers over. Once I got back into powerlifting, and I started lifting, and then actually started hitting new weights for me yeah that made me start to feel more confident so i thought if i can do this in the gym where i'm putting in the effort that transfers over to life where okay if i put in the effort and i succeed not every day is going to be the best day ever and that's one of the biggest things i've learned from powerlifting i go into the gym a lot and honestly a lot of the days i question why am i even doing powerlifting this is an awful session but one of the best pieces of advice i heard in powerlifting that i think can apply to all aspects of life is this older gentleman who is a powerlifter told me, you know, even if you get in a bad session, the worst session of your life, you're still getting in a session. You're still training. Absolutely. You're still showing up. And that's exactly how it is with life. So I started to learn from what I was doing with my physical self-care that, okay, if I can do this, even if it's not great, I'm still doing it. And that's a start because failure and disappointment are huge catalysts for growth and learning that, okay, Yes, I failed at this, but why did I fail? And pinpoint And what did I learn? Yeah, and pinpoint what did I learn? How can I get better? And then you're a little bit more successful each time. And then you learn from that, okay, how can I get even better? Yes. A little bit yep. more successful. And that applies in your work life. So for me with marketing, with anything in your if you're doing triathlon, powerlifting, CrossFit, running, yoga, whatever. Producing you do. a podcast. Producing a podcast, <laughs> you learn from the failure and disappointment. And that's how you transition to okay. I didn't make the right choice to, okay, maybe I actually can do this. I can learn. I can learn from myself. If I don't have anything else, I can learn from myself. Right. Well, even, you know, us taking over and and doing the podcast in-house has been an extraordinary learning curve for us. But every time we've tried something new, included something, we've learned from it. And we're incorporating that learning, which is what you just described in every choice you made regardless of outcome, whether you got the expected outcome, whether you got a different outcome, you learned, which is really kind of in alignment with a growth mindset that we talked about in season two. And when we join with life from that place, it really helps, I think, us get to a place of self-acceptance, especially in a floundering stage like this, because Even though, like I said in the intro, I think it's most acute in young adulthood because people have the least experience in being an adult when they're 18 to 24, yet they are asked to be taking on these adult responsibilities. So it feels so overwhelming. We get lost throughout our lives. We flounder throughout our lives. And as we're integrating aspects of our identity. And as we're understanding ourselves across time, we have to know how to be in relationship with ourselves when we're lost. Because when we're unsure, when we don't know what's next, when we're undoing what we've done, and we don't quite know where we're going next, we need to be in a really loving relationship with ourselves, or it's going to be really hard to get unlost. Yeah, for sure. And especially hearing you say that graduating for people graduating high school or graduating college, this is the first time in your life that you're not only making all these adult decisions, but you're thinking for yourself your whole life. You've had to people tell you, these are the classes you're taking next, or this is the set amount of classes or set classes that you have to take in college to get this degree. This is what you do have to do to get this degree. This is what you have to do to graduate 
high school. This is what you have to do to make this sports team. And you graduate college, boom, you don't have anybody to tell you what's next. You're like out in the open, lost. Out in the open. Even you just describing that way sounds so vulnerable. You're just out in the open standing here like, okay, yeah, what am I going to do? And I think people could make the argument, and we see it in media all the time, that the world is smaller now because of the internet connecting us all. I think that in some ways that makes the world feel larger because it's there's so much access to anything. It makes it, I think, so much harder to pick a path. I used to laugh about this with my husband when we had cable. I was like, I don't like cable because... <laughs> How in the world am I going to pick from 400 channels? What does that even mean to have 400 channels? And sometimes I think that's kind of the same mindset that young adults in this stage have. Like, there's so many things. What in the world am I going to pick? Exactly. And that's what I was just having a conversation about because I was telling him, you know, it's not that I'm overwhelmed by oh my gosh, I have to do this. I'm more overwhelmed by, I have so many choices that I yes. know I can do this, but now I don't know what I want to do because there are so many different things. Right. And just combing through those and figuring out not necessarily what is perfect for me and what is the right decision, but what will grow me the most? What will I benefit from the most? What will I enjoy the most? Yes. And this is where I think mindfulness is especially useful for people because to help kind of navigate that, I think what matters is how are we connecting with what we're doing? If we're doing things that don't match our beliefs, that don't match our skill set, that don't match our interests, that we aren't connected to in really key ways, it's probably not something that we're going to grow from and build upon. We might survive it, And we might push through it, but it's not something that we're going to really want to kind of nurture and cultivate and develop into something. But if we're not aware of how we're experiencing what we're actually involved in, it's going to be hard to navigate that. So the more people can incorporate mindfulness into their day-to-day living and day-to-day choices, they can start to kind of map out, how does this resonate with my beliefs? Does this fit with my skill set? How so? If not, how so? Do I get excited about this kind of work? What kind of things excite me about it? What kind of things don't? Then you can start to feel out a little bit more, you know, almost like in any kind of music uh, streaming service that you would use when you're Mm self-selecting, you know, you're thumbs upping and thumbs downing what you're doing so that you're, you're actually creating a map. Even if you don't realize you're creating a map, you are. Yeah. All right. So as you look back on where you are now in a more settled place, based on where you were when you started this, what is the one or two things that you would go back and tell your former self when you were just in this floundering stage? What would you want her to know? Oh, man, that's definitely I think about that a lot about how genuinely sweet of a season that was for me and I didn't realize it and it's such a funny thing because I had an internship at the time where I didn't have a job but I was interning I was doing odd jobs here and there and the lady I was interning for said to me wow I'm so sorry you're in such a season of disappointment but to me I I didn't feel that way at all I knew it was a rough patch I knew that things weren't perfect and they weren't the way that I wanted to be and obviously it was super overwhelming But in that moment and looking back, that was not at all a season of disappointment for me. It was such a sweet season because there's a lot of other stuff going on too. Where I lived, I didn't have internet. It was just, and I had a lot of free time with no internet. So it was really the season of learning and growing and connecting to myself and Mm. really creating intentional relationships with myself, my friends, my family. So it was this amazing, incredible season of building the foundation that I could continue to build upon as I solidified who I was as I continued through this process that we're calling the floundering. And so that would be one thing I wish I could tell myself to just lean into that. To lean into the discomfort and trust the process of it. Yeah, absolutely. And not view things so negatively. So fatalistically. Yeah. And the other thing, somewhat of a tangent off of that is 
at the end of the floundering process, as we've talked about self-acceptance, knowing that there is no right way, really acknowledging that concept for myself and not having to worry about comparing myself so much to uh, other people's yes. standards. Because it's taken me a long time to grow out of that and to stop comparing myself and stop thinking, okay, well, this person is doing this or making this amount of money and I'm not, so I'm not successful. But realizing there's no right way, only what fits, like we talked about, what fits my skill sets, my beliefs, my desires, my passions. If I'm waking up each day and I'm happy, that's a huge win because happiness is such a huge thing. And so that would be the other thing I would tell myself is really lean into what fits your beliefs and your skill sets and not trying to lean into what society says is right yeah. or what other people say is right or you have to do. You don't have to go back to grad school. You don't have to go get this huge paying job at a corporate business. If that's not what you want to do, if that's not going to make you happy. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. So what I heard you say is you would tell your younger self, actually lean in to the not knowing because you're discovering some really beautiful things about yourself and the world and to trust what you love, because that's going to eventually create an outcome that feels like it fits. And that's what's fulfilling to not base your decisions on other people's outcomes. Yeah, those are definitely the two things I would go back and tell myself. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me today. And thank you for sharing your experience. I really appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you. We are changing things up with one of our dear sponsors today. And we are going to hear from Brian Lamb, the owner of Skin Touch Therapy himself, about his fantastic infrared saunas. We just added infrared saunas about a year ago, and infrared saunas are a dry sauna, and it uses light waves or light energy to warm the body. So instead of just like a steam room that uses hot steam to warm the air or the room, infrared saunas are actually your body's just absorbing this light energy. And it's really safe. There's no harmful rays. So it's not like UV rays or anything that will give you sunburn. And it's actually the same technology that they use for incubators for babies to warm the babies. Just think of it. You're just that adult person getting this nice, deep warmth. And the warmth actually goes into the layers of the skin and your bodies. And that's why it really helps with circulation, helps with relaxation, muscle tension. There's so many benefits because it's actually penetrating your your core. Thanks so much for popping in to tell us all about how fantastic your infrared saunas are, Brian. Please, everyone, go check them out at skintouchtherapyspa.com. You can see what the infrared saunas look like. You can schedule there. You can even call them to find out more information. It is really worth your time and investment. I've been there. I can't wait to go back. And ah, wasn't Haley so fantastic? I really enjoy talking to her about all kinds of things. And I feel like this conversation was a really down-to-earth way to explain a really important life transition. I am certain you all felt as connected and delighted by her as we get to on a daily basis here at the practice. And I really hope that everybody listening kind of got some insight into the, the normalcy of being lost and really understanding how important it is to meet yourself there with acceptance and compassion. And before I get to today's letter, I just want to remind everyone that these podcast episodes, although we talk about really important therapeutic concepts and we give you methods to use to kind of connect you to aspects of yourself in a more intentional, mindful way, It's not really a substitute for therapy, and we always recommend that people find therapy help in their communities as they're doing this work and utilize our podcast kind of as something along the side, another tool in the toolbox for education purposes. And 
some of the comments that we've been getting about the meaningful aspects of the letters, we really, really appreciate. And I just want to highlight that, you know, my letters are an example, a template really based on my own experience with those parts of myself. And so if you decide to utilize these letters in your own work of integrating your aspects of self, your identity, then your letters may turn out to be different than mine. And that's absolutely fine. What's important is that the letter includes some aspect of holding space for that part of yourself, some acknowledgement of how that part of yourself has been impacted, and specific ways that you are going to be in a mindful, collaborative relationship with that part of self. So in the spirit of that, here's today's letter. To my lost selves, what you must feel, abandoned, overwhelmed, betrayed, distrustful, maybe like the sturdy ground you used to know has become more like a rickety, even rotting wooden suspension bridge that you aren't sure you can trust to lead you to the next place a place you do not know and may not even want to go toward. There is so much yet unknown, so much that is unfamiliar, and so much that now may leave a bitter aftertaste in your mouth. You must have so many questions. Although I don't speak for you and I don't want to assume what those questions are, I do want to offer you respite, a soft place to rest and catch your breath. And I can tell you that your lostness, whatever the reason, isn't about your adequacy. Because getting lost, although it is happening to you, isn't a statement about you. It is more a process that defines our common humanity, the continual evolution, redefinition that requires us to let go of the familiar, that no longer feels fitting, to forge a new path in honor of becoming, to come home to ourselves in ever more authentic ways. And so I offer you rest, support, an acknowledgement of the hard work and effort you expend to move through the lostness, finding your way once more onto more solid ground, even if unfamiliar. When you feel alone, I will remind you that I see you, and I will hold space for you exactly as you are. When you doubt your ability to gain clarity, I will remind you that clarity is a process, and each intentional step that you take is creating a picture and a path that has meaning and value for you. And when you are tired of the work and overwhelmed by what is left or what remains, I will put my arm around you and offer you a resting place to reflect and savor the experiences along the way. I believe in you steadfastly. Allison. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Integration Nation with Allison Sullivan, licensed clinical social worker of downtown Fredericksburg, Virginia. We are going to continue to explore and discuss with our guests throughout the season how to integrate our experiences, the roles that we take on, and the unique aspects of ourselves in developing and making sense of our identity across time. Our upcoming episodes will be featuring international and local experts on breathwork, bodywork, parenting, and other important aspects of our identity. Listen to more episodes surrounding these concepts and integrative mental health at allisonsintegrativehealth.org.